Hi there. I'm going to be uh, demonstrating for students preoperative nursing care and postoperative care uh, of a surgical patient. The first thing I'm going to do, as you were taught in the lab, is every time that you enter a patient's room, you are going to use the waterless soap and wash your hands in front of the patient. The next thing that you're going to be doing is swiping the patient. Stating your name, washing your hands, identifying the patient and the procedure and privacy, etc. So, good morning. This is Elliot Grant, and you can either check with the computer. Elliot, could you, for safety purposes, give me your name and your date of birth? And then the patient will respond, Elliot Grant 4681. All right, so I've identified the patient. Now, if Elliot Grant was going to surgery, the things that nurses need to do preoperatively is that in the pre-op um, period, there needs to be a surgical consent form that's signed by the patient, the physician, and witnessed by the nurse. And just so you know, you only witness the signature. That's all that you're witnessing as a nurse. Also, prior to going to surgery, the patient has what's called a preoperative checklist. And this is what the nurse needs to make sure that she or he fills out before the patient goes to surgery. And for example, what is on here for general surgery is that the patient has the applicable identification bands. And in some institutions, there's an ID band on the ankle as well as the wrist. There's two forms of identification for safety. Also, in, for some patients, especially over the age of 65, they may have to have a cardiogram, a chest X-ray. They may have to have some lab values on there um, and um, because of their age. The other thing is that uh, any excess jewelry, hair pieces, dentures, hearing aids, all need to be removed. Now that can be sensitive for some patients, so if they refuse to have their dentures removed, uh, that can be done in the operating suite after they've been sedated. Now, during the preoperative period, it's important for the nurse to take baseline vital signs on the patient, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and SpO2. Also, it's important to do some medication reconciliation, and most patients having general surgery will be NPO after midnight, nothing to eat or drink because um, when you are under general anesthesia, the risk for aspiration and regurgitation is great. So um, that is a, another safety measure. The other piece that you may have to do for the patient is uh, make sure that you tell them to go into the bathroom and uh, urinate. They need to take all their clothing off be except for a patient gown, which you'll give them. And again, if there's an emergency that comes up during the procedure, um, it, they need access to the patient's body. That's the rationale for that. Also, the other thing that you may want to do for a patient is do some education in regards to what they may expect after the surgery. So for this particular case, this patient's having abdominal surgery. Um, you um, may want to explain to them what's going to be going on, which I'll talk about in a moment postoperatively. But I do want to just uh, show you how to educate your patient in how to turn, cough, and deep breathe, which is done for general surgery, patients who have had some major surgery at least every two hours, the first 24 to 48 hours. If they are smokers or have uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they will also need to do some what I call exercises for the lungs by utilizing the um, incentive spirometer or the arabica. And I'll explain the rationale for those in a few moments. Now, when a person is after surgery, we need to prevent a lot of complications, pneumonia, uh, 
venous insufficiency, which can lead to a pulmonary embolism. Um, we, want to, we want to prevent any aspiration. So there's a lot of things that we do for the patient that are standard. When we teach a patient to take a deep breath what we really want them to do is diaphragmatic breathing if they can. As students, we teach you to put your hands on the diaphragm and to instruct the patient to take a deep breath and separate those thumbs in through the nose, out through the mouth. This helps to expand the lungs, to kind of exercise them, to prevent any secretion from pooling and to limit uh, the cause of congestion or pneumonia. Even more effective than that is coughing. And when a patient has an abdominal incision, coughing will hurt. But it's really important because it keeps the secretion moving in your lungs, it prevents it from settling, and it also prevents a condition called atelectasis, which is a partial uh, collapse of the lung. So when a person has an, an abdominal incision, you're going to make them splint their incision with a bath blanket. You're gonna have them take a nice deep breath like I already showed you, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and then have them take a deep breath and hold it and cough it out. <coughs> cough it out and it does hurt and they will tell you about that. But splinting their stomach helps immensely. So turning and coughing, good what we call pulmonary toileting, good respiratory hygiene. Now the other thing that we teach patients to do every two hours are leg exercises. So the leg exercises that you should teach your patients are to do flexion and extension or what we would call plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, internal rotation, external rotation, flexion and extension of the knee. These are examples of what they should do to keep circulation flowing in the low extremity, to increase venous return, and to prevent a venous thromboembolism. The other thing that's important for a patient postoperatively is most patients now who have had major surgery will have a sequential compression device. This sequential compression device intermittently fills with air and it will go in and out and it simulates what we call increased venous return. It simulates the muscles pushing venous return back up out of the legs and recirculating it to prevent venous stasis and to prevent uh, any what we call venous thromboembolism, which can occur after surgery due to immobility. Okay, so that's the teaching that we can do. Remember preoperatively, uh, the patient will uh, go to the operating suite uh, shave prepping and things of that nature now are not done before they go. Everything is done in the operating suite. And uh, once they get there, they will cover their head with a uh, paper, paper cap. And uh, again, um, there's many safety checks that go on in the OR, which you will get with your surgical lecture in the second semester. Okay, so that's the kind of the preoperative piece here uh, that we need to do as nurses. And again, you're gonna answer any questions that they have, but typically they're very cognizant or they understand what procedure they're gonna be having done. Now, when the patient comes back from surgery postoperatively, there's a period of time after surgery where they're gonna to go to what we call the post-anesthesia care unit, where they're going to reverse the anesthetics possibly extubate them because lots of patients who go under uh, general anesthesia have an endotracheal tube in and someone breathes for them. So getting them to breathe back on their own for some patient takes a, patients takes a period of time. This particular patient here had a, had a um, 
removal of a portion of the bowel, an appendix, and a re-anastomosis, so an appendectomy as well. This particular patient, when they come back from the operating suite, or excuse me, the post-anesthesia care unit, if they're really sleepy, um, we want to make sure to put them in what we call a recovery position, which is sideline. By placing a patient sideline, um, that helps them, it helps to uh, uh, prevent obstruction of the tongue in the airway. And again, if they get a bit nauseous, which occurs after anesthetics, they're laying on their side, which prevents emesis from going down into the airway. The other thing, when the patient comes back from the post-anesthesia care unit, they're gonna have all kinds of lines. And what you need to do is you need to do some line reconciliation. My particular patient here has an epidural drip, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, which is commonly used for pain now. The patient has IV fluids because they're not gonna be eating for a few days until their bowel, bowel sounds return. This patient also has an abdominal wound with a binder. This patient has a couple of drainage devices, which I'll talk about in a moment, a Jackson Pratt and a Hemovac. And we've already talked about the SCVs. So you wanna do some line reconciliation so you know what's going on and at what rate these epidural drip is flowing and the IV fluids. Okay. Now, when a patient comes back, we do what's called frequent vital sign checks. Vital signs are vital to life and they tell us what's going on hemodynamically. So vital signs, every hospital has a different protocol, but vital signs are done um, when a patient comes back from the OR much more frequently than normal. Sometimes every 15 to 30 minutes times four, if they're stable, every hour times four, every two hours times four, every four hours times 24, because we need to watch those vital signs and assess them to make sure that the person is in good fluid balance, is in hemorrhaging, et cetera. So frequent vital signs. Uh, the other thing when a patient comes back, you need to keep reorienting them sometimes. They're gonna be a little foggy, a little groggy in regards to where they are and what's going on. Now what I'm going to talk about is I'm also going to talk about <clears throat> what we have here as far as post-operative drains. This is called the Jackson Pratt drain. Remember, when drains are placed in or near a wound, it helps to drain out any fluid, decreasing pressure under the incisional line so that healing can occur because uh, that will help to keep the incisional line sealed up, heal well, and decrease pressure under the surface. Jackson Pratt's are used frequently now. And uh, the thing that I want to tell you about a Jackson Pratt or a Hemovac, I'll start with the Jackson Pratt. Because these mannequins are human, I cannot get them to work appropriately. This Jackson Pratt works in that when we empty this, okay, and by the way, when these drains are more than half full, you have to empty them because it alters the suction on them. Okay. When you empty a drain, you need to collapse it. It applies suction and then put the cover on and you see it applies suction, pulling out the fluid in or near or around the wound, the inner wound, okay? Same thing with the hemovac, which is a larger drain for more uh, fluid remo being removed from the wound. So with this, you're gonna empty it this way here. You would use a separate container and measure the, the surgeons really monitor this closely, the amount of fluid, okay? And then again, you're gonna collapse this and it applies suction, okay?
So those are the, the drainage, the drains. And it's important to put those on the I and O. Now the other thing this patient has here is a binder. And remember the binder applies some great support when they cough, turn, or move. And for a while they weren't using them, but now uh, they're used a lot. Remember the rules with the binder is it needs to be under the costal margin. And when you affix it together, not directly over the wound because it will hurt them. Um, and it needs to be removed and reapplied. In order to get a proper fit, you need to measure around the waist because it comes in different sizes. Um, and now they even have these Velcro tabs on top so that you can hang the drains this way. Okay, I did one and I didn't do the other. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidural drip. I'm going to move over here. An epidural is a line that sits in the epidural space or the caudus, the tail of the spinal cord. Epidural medication is used for post-operative pain. It's very effective. It's placed by an anesthesiologist only. Sterily, they'll put in a little needle into that area. And it's not sutured in place, which is very important for you to know because they can come out. It's placed in the epidural space and um, the benefit of this is that the medication, either fentanyl citrate or hydromorphone or morphine, binds with the opiate receptors in the cerebral spine, in the fluid, spinal fluid, and causes immediate profound relief. Very potent, you don't have to use as much because it's immediate relief, because it binds instantly. Now, Precautions with this line that's in the epidural space of your back, you can walk around with it. It's not like spinal anesthesia, don't get it mixed up. But that needle can cause a hematoma, it can cause an infection and bleeding, which is not, uh, which is a major complication because it's going to cause that kind of bleeding into the spinal area or hematoma or infection. If you notice, this fentanyl, I don't have a pump, but it has a special pump. The nurse would check the dose. What the nurse does is we titrate this up or down according to pain. We have an order, a prescription for that. But also we assess things very closely because this can stop your breathing because it's a potent opiate. The other thing you want to notice is that this line is yellow. It's unique. There are no other lines like this. It's yellow and has no ports because it only can be used for epidural pain control. We do not push anything through it. We hang new bags and that is it. And if there's any issue with the line, we call anesthesia immediately. But here are the routine checks that nurses do. I'm gonna turn my patient over and I want you to look at this line here. The epidural line here is in the epidural space. It's taped up the back and the nurse needs to assess this window for any bleeding, any leakage, okay? always to make sure that it's, it's intact. But this is what an epidural line looks like, okay? Now, that is the kind of the, the physical assessment of the line. These epidural lines, the tubing is changed every 96 hours like other lines are, okay? Now, <clears throat> this epidural potent opiate will decrease peristalsis, will cause urinary retention. So patients that have an epidural line usually have a Foley or urinary catheter to constant drainage. They need laxatives when their bowel starts moving so that they can uh, have a bowel movement. 
Additionally, common side effects with this medication are generalized itching. This medication, for some particular reason, when it binds with the opiate receptors, patients will complain of itching. So we usually have a PRN order for diphenhydramine. The other thing that happens is when they move too quickly, they get the spins and a bit of nausea. So sometimes we have a PRN order as well for Odansetron. We also have a PRN order for Naloxone or Narcan. And what nurses need to assess while this drip is going, vital signs every four hours and the respiratory rate needs to be 12 or above. If it goes below that, then we need to decrease the rate of the drip. Also, we check, check the blood pressure because these medications can really suppress the blood pressure immensely. So vital sign checks are critical. The other thing that is very important for the nurse to check on a post-operative patient that has fentanyl, sometimes, or any other opiate, it's mixed with bupivacaine. Bupivacaine's an anal, uh, anesthet uh, anesthesia agent, kind of local anesthetic, I should say. But the bupivacaine, what the bupivacaine does is it binds with the opiate, making it more po potent, more pot you know, more potency. The problem with the bupivacaine is that it can alter your motor activity and sensation. So the thing that we need to do for our patients who have bupivacaine in the fentanyl is we need to do a great circulation, sensation, and motion check. Again, circulation, checking capillary refill under three, checking your pedal pulse, post tibial, radial pulses. Also, sensation is critical. If you're gonna get your patient up, it's the first time, they have an epidural drip, and they have bupivacaine mixed with the fentanyl, they may not have any what I call legs. You may try to get them up and they can't stand and they fall. So you want to make sure that they have good sensation and motion. So you can do two checks as you already previously learned. You can do sharp and dull. Have them shut their eyes, sharp and dull. What do you feel? Sharp or dull. Or let me know when I touch you, okay? With the cotton ball. So either one, you want to check sensation. Now motion is have the patient grab your hands, grab my hands and squeeze, push to see if you, they get, can you push against my, can you open up, can you resist me? So you want to get a sense before you get them up that they have some strength so they can stand and they can feel, okay? Um, otherwise than that, the last thing that is left is airway, which is critically important. It's the number one priority, making sure that they have the head of the bed up, easier for breathing, oxygen if, it's, if it is prescribed. But the other piece is the pulmonary toileting or hygiene. An incentive spirometer, incentive in, an incentive spirometer causes the patient, you can keep setting it up as they keep attaining their goals, what they're going to do is inhale, and as they inhale, the bellows will go up to where it's supposed to be. And that is causing increased inspiration, exercising the lungs. And there, if, especially if they're a smoker, if they have respiratory alterations, it's 10, 10, excuse me, 10 times an hour while awake. Now the Irabica or acapella in some institutions, the acapella is called a pickle, works the other way. The Irabica works in that what you're going to do in this is not inspire, but you're gonna exhale. Exhale as hard as you can, you put your lips on it, and there's some resistance on this here as well, okay? And it makes you exhale forcefully. So again, exercising that component of your respiratory system. Exhalation or expiration, inhalation. Incentive spirometer, arabica. And yes, sometimes both are utilized. I think that's about all I wanna talk about. I hope this is helpful, thank you.